Welcome to the Reading the Bible Daily with Dave podcast. This podcast is devoted to helping increase your daily exposure to God's Word with a short scripture reading and brief commentary on key ideas, themes, and theology in each chapter. Now please join your host, Dave Jenkins, for today's episode. Well, welcome back to the Reading the Bible Daily with Dave podcast. My name is Dave, and today is May 18th, and today we're going to look at Exodus 33. And just as a reminder, every day I read from one chapter of God's Word, so today, Exodus 33, and then I offer a brief explanation of key ideas, themes, and the theology in that chapter. My goal is to get you into God's Word for about 5 to 20 minutes every day. So let's get to our reading today from Exodus 33. So Exodus 33 says this, The Lord said to Moses, Depart, go up from here, you and the people whom you have brought up out of the land of Egypt, to the land which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, To your offspring I will give give it to you. I will send an angel before you, and I will drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Go up to the land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go up among you, lest I consume you on the way, for you are stiff-necked people." And when the people heard this disastrous word, they mourned, and no one put on his ornaments. For the Lord had said to Moses, Say to the people of Israel, You are a stiff-necked people. If for a single moment I should go up among you, I would consume you. So now take off your ornaments, that I may know what to do with you. Therefore the people of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments from Mount Horeb onward. Now, now Moses used to take the tent and pitch it outside the camp, far off from the camp, and he called it the tent of meeting. And everyone who sought the Lord would go to the tent of meeting, which was outside the camp. And whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people would rise up and each would stand at his tent door and watch Moses until he had gone into this tent. And when Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent, and the Lord would speak with Moses. And when all the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, all the people would rise up and worship each at his tent. And thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. And when Moses turned up and into the camp, his assistant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, would not depart from the tent. Now Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, Bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. And now therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, please show me your ways, that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. Consider too that this nation is your people. And he said, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. And he said to them, If your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not in your going with us, so that we are distinct, I and your people, from every other people on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, This very thing that you have spoken I will do. For for you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. Moses said, Please show me your glory. And he said, I will make all the goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But he said, You cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock. And while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. And then I will take away my hand and you shall see my back but my face shall not be seen well this is our reading today from exodus 33 and so what we see here is moses intercedes for the people after the incident with the golden calf in exodus 32 this chapter narrates the tension of the events as the lord says he will not go among his people and the existence of a temporary tent of meeting raises questions about the future of the tabernacle and now it's in this context that moses continues to mature in the role of covenant representative as he again intercedes for the people of god 
So in the first eight verses, the Lord instructs Moses to lead the people toward the land of Canaan. It promises again that an angel will go before them because uh, Israel is a stiff-necked people, the Lord says. He will not go up among them so as not to destroy them. And so when Moses intercedes on Israel's behalf, he will ask that the Lord go with Israel, particularly because of their condition and their need for his pardon. Now, in verses 7 through 11, here we see the description of this tent of meeting being located far off and outside the camp. It contrasts with the description of the tabernacle as a place where the Lord was to dwell in their midst. This section steps off the main storyline. It introduces tension in the narrative related to how the covenant breach and the Lord's response will affect the existence of the sanctuary that had been described. Now, the remainder of this section, it hangs with that expectant hope in light of the Lord's abiding presence in the pillar of the cloud and the continued relationship with Moses to whom he speaks face to face. The people uh, focus on Moses whenever he would go in and out of the camp. It foreshadows the way that his intercession will be the means by which the Lord commits himself to come back into their midst. Uh, verses 12 through 16. So Moses intercedes again on behalf of the people and appeals both to the special relationship that he has with the Lord and to the fact that this nation is God's people. And although God has drawn back from destroying all the people, he has promised only to send an angel to lead them into the land. Well, this is not good enough or Moses who demands that the Lord himself accompany them in verse 15. God accepts his plea and his presence is demonstrated personally to Moses in Exodus 33, 7. 17 through Exodus 34 28 and publicly by the construction of the tabernacle in Exodus 35 through 40. Now in verses 17 through 18, Moses requests to see the Lord's glory should be interpreted primarily in light of his role as a covenant representative on behalf of the people and not simply for the sake of his own experience, however much he desired that personal blessing. And so in response to the Lord saying that he will go down with his people, Moses is asking him to signify his presence as he did when the covenant was confirmed at Mount Sinai and maybe even more particularly to pledge that he will dwell among his people in the tabernacle so that both he and the people would be sanctified by his glory as in Exodus 29, 43 through 46. Now in verse 19, the Lord's words appear to be a response to Moses' request that the Lord would show him his way and his glory. And now the description points forward to the events of the Lord's declaration in Exodus 34, 5 through 6. I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. I will be gracious and show you mercy in Exodus 34, 6. Paul cites this in Romans 9, 15 to show that even when God shows mercy, it's because he has chosen to do so. So at this point, the Israelites weren't quite sure what would happen next. God had told them that he wasn't going with them. It was all too dangerous, not for him, but for them. They hadn't repented of their sin. They had taken off the ornaments of their idolatry as God had commanded, and now they were waiting to see what God would do. Now, the Bible doesn't resolve this tension. Will God go with the Israelites or will they have to go without them? Well, we don't find out until later in this chapter. And while we're waiting, the Bible tells us that Moses and the tent of meeting. Many Bible scholars complain about what they see here as a change of subject. Some say the next section of Exodus is completely out of place. Well, the truth is, of course, is that what comes next belongs next right where the Holy Spirit put it. The Bible brings us to a crucial point in the story of salvation but instead of resolving things right away, it leaves us hanging in suspense. That's an excellent way to tell a story. Furthermore, what comes next begins to resolve the problem because these verses show that there was at least one man who could come into the presence of God in verses 7 through 11. Now, this tent of meeting was not the tabernacle. What makes this somewhat confusing is elsewhere in Exodus, the inner structure of the tabernacle is also called the tent of meeting. Both tents were places to meet with God. And yet at this point, when the tabernacle had not yet been fully built, Moses had his own private tent of meeting. Now, one significant difference between the two tents was that whereas the tabernacle stood at the center, Moses pitched his tent outside the camp, way outside. 
And scripture stresses that it was located some distance from the Israelites. It had to be far away because the Israelites were still under divine judgment. Their camp was still a place of sin, and God said that he would not dwell in it. And so, at least for the time being, if the Israelites wanted to meet with God, they had to go outside the camp. They were separated from God by their sin. And yet, God had not entirely abandoned them. The tent of meeting was a temporary tabernacle, an alternative place to meet with God. And what happened at the sanctuary? was amazing. Moses would leave the camp and walk out to the tent of meeting. And as he was going, the people would stand and worship from a distance. They were looking to their mediator as he went to meet with God. And when Moses entered the tent, a pillar of cloud would come down from heaven and cover the entrance. This was a theophany, a visible manifestation of the glorious presence of God. The glory cloud showed that that people that Moses was meeting with God. And what happened inside the tent of meeting was just as amazing. Moses talked with God. He had talked with God back at the burning bush and again on the top of the holy mountain, but now God was coming down to meet with him in the tent. In grace, he was condescending to communicate with his prophet. And there at the tent of meeting, God spoke with Moses face to face as a man meets with his friend, as we see in Exodus 33, 11. Now, the phrase face to face does not mean that Moses could see God for just a few verses later. In verse 20, it says that no one may see me and live. Rather, it's a figure of speech intended to show that God and his prophet enjoyed direct communication. Moses had immediate access to God. This was a level of intimacy and fellowship that no human being had experienced since the day that God banished Adam and Eve from the garden. Moses and God were friends. God told him everything that he needed to know about his plan for Israel. He spoke with Moses like a, like a friend with a friend. This means that there was still hope. God had told the Israelites that he would not go up in the middle of their camp. But at least he was still talking to their mediator. There was a place outside the camp where God would meet with Moses. And anyone who wanted to know God's will could approach the tent of meeting, talk things over with Moses, and then wait for Moses to inquire of God. And although God would not stay in their midst, they would go out and meet with God through their mediator. And so even this limited form of contact was an extraordinary privilege. The people were distanced from God by their sin, and yet there was still a point of contact a way for them to connect with God. And as we consider what Israel had to do to meet with God, we're reminded of the amazing privilege that we have today. Where can we go to meet with God? Well, we don't have to stay at a distance. We don't have to go outside the camp. We don't have to approach the tent of meeting. We don't have to consult with a prophet or a priest. As believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, we have immediate access to God through the presence of the Holy Spirit. Today, the tent of meeting is inside of us because God has come to make us home in us. This is the work of God, the Holy Spirit. Uh, Jesus has sent the Spirit to live in us uh, as we see throughout the Word of God. In fact, Paul prays in Ephesians 3, 16 through 17, that I have his glorious riches, he, God, may strengthen you with power uh, through his Spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. This means that we are the place of God's dwelling. From the very moment that we receive Jesus into our hearts by faith, we are in direct communication with the Almighty God. You see, this is what happens when one becomes a Christian. God comes into our lives in a whole new way. He is with us all the time. We have constant communion with Him. And now when we read the Word of God, God talks to us like a friend with a friend. His Holy Spirit applies His Word directly to our minds and to our hearts. All the promises in the Bible are promises that God made to us in Christ. All the warnings are warnings to us. All the commandments are commandments to us. God speaks to us in His Word. And so the communication is two-way because when we pray, we we are speaking back to God. We tell God how much we love Him. We confess our sin. We share our worries. We talk about our problems. We ask for His help. We speak with God like a friend with a friend. This is what it means to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. It means to be in direct and constant communication with the Almighty God. And now that God is with us and within us, we know that He will never leave us nor forsake us, but will always be with us wherever He goes. This is the promise of God in Matthew 28, 20 that I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. You see, Jesus will never get up and leave our camp. Yet, this is exactly what some Christians fear. When we fall into serious sin, we sometimes doubt whether God is still for us. Our sense of guilt is so great that we begin to question our relation with God, asking, does God still love me? Can God still use me? Will God still bless me? Or am I so stiff-necked? 
that he will abandon me? The answer is, is that God never abandons his friends. Every friend of his is a friend forever. God has invested far too much in this friendship to abandon us. In fact, John 15, 13 says, greater love has no one than this, that he may lay down his life for his friends. And then he goes on to say in verses 14 through 15 of John 15, you are my friends. I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my father. I have made known to you. You see, we have the same high privilege that Moses did to be called a friend of God. But if anything, our privilege is even greater because we know what, what sacrifice Jesus made to secure our friendship. He laid down his life for us dying for our sins on the cross. And so as we study the history of salvation, we see God always moving in the direction of a closer intimacy with his people. He is always seeking to restore the intimate fellowship we lost through sin. All throughout Exodus, he is trying to find a way to dwell with his people. Well, he can't do it in Exodus 33, but he but he hasn't given up trying either. He's still meeting with Moses. Soon he will go ahead and with his plans for the tabernacle, and by the end of Exodus, he will come down to dwell with his people in glory. Well, the tabernacle story is only the beginning. Eventually, God did come down in the person of his son and tabernacled among us, but he wanted us to have an even more intimate relation with us, and so he sent his spirit to dwell in our hearts by faith. One day he will take us into his very presence. And then the word of God says we will see him face to face in 1 Corinthians 13, 12. This has always been the plan of God. He wants to draw us into closer and closer relationship with himself. God wants to do the same thing in our lives as Christians. He wants to develop in us a deeper and more intimate relationship with us. He wants to us to hear his voice speaking in the word of God. He wants us to trust in his promises, depend on his grace, live by his spirit. And he wants us to talk to him, growing more intimate with him through prayer. Do you have that kind of friendship with God? He is inviting you to get to know him by trusting in the person and work of Jesus as revealed in the word of God. And when you receive Jesus Christ in your life by faith, then God is with you. He will never leave you. You, he will be your friend forever. Well, to this point, most people would have been satisfied. God told Moses that his prayer request would be granted in verse 17. God promised to give the prophet exactly what he asked for, but Moses wanted more. Made increasingly confident by the way that God answered his first two requests, he said, now show me your glory in verse 18. This request was not as abrupt as most translations make it sound. In the Hebrew, it comes across more like an entreaty. Moses was saying, please, but it was more like an audacious request. The prophet was asking to see the splendor and the radiance of God. Glory is the weightiness of the divine being of God, and Moses wanted to see it for himself. And so he said with holy boldness, show me your glory. Well, Moses had already seen something of the glory of God. He caught his first glimpse at the burning bush, which blazed with fire, but was not consumed. He got another glimpse with the 70 elders who saw God in Exodus 24. And then he was covered with glory when he went to the mountaintop and entered the cloud of God's presence in Exodus 24. He saw glory, God's glory yet again at the tent of meeting where the pillar of cloud descended uh, from heaven in Exodus 33, 9. But somehow Moses knew that there was still more to see. Remember that when he and the elders saw God, the only thing they actually saw was the pavement under his feet in Exodus 24. And so although he had seen something of God's luminous majesty, he had not yet gazed upon his deity and all its brilliance. Moses wanted a full revelation of God's glory, a visible display of the essential quality of his being. Now, why did Moses make this request? Well, maybe it was because he understood the meaning of the Exodus, that God was saving a people for his own glory. If that was the plan, then this seemed like the obvious next step, a full revelation of the glory of God. Or maybe it was because Moses wanted to know God more intimately. Only moments before he had said, teach me your ways that I may know you in Exodus 33, 13. What better way to know God than to see a total revelation of his glory? Well, whatever his reasons for asking, Moses wanted to have a personal encounter with the glory of God. And God's answer is given in verses 19 through 20. And that answer was a yes and a no answer. See, God was willing to reveal his transcendent goodness to Moses. He was willing to announce his sacred name, uh, Yahweh, just as he had done back at the burning bush. He was willing to reveal the sovereign grace of his mercy and compassion. And that is amazing. Moses would have the high privilege of seeing the goodness of God, which is one of the beauties of his divine being. What God was not willing to do was to allow Moses to gaze upon his glory. In other words, he would not give the prophet a direct perception 
conception of his divine being. His goodness would pass by, and even this was only for a moment. God would not stand by for close scrutiny, but the fullness of his glory would not be seen at all. Well, the reason for this restriction was very simple. If Moses were to see the complete revelation of God in his eternal being, it'd be so overwhelming that it would destroy him. God is absolute in his perfection. Moses was a finite, fallen creature, and as such, he could not see God and live. No one can. See, God was willing to show as much of himself as Moses could bear, but there were limits. Some things are beyond our capacity to know. Moses could not see the absolute character of God as God is in himself. So, in order to protect Moses from any deadly exposure to his radiant glory, God made some special arrangements, as we see in verses 21 through 23. And so, Moses was not allowed to look God in the face, but only to see, as it were, a fleeting glimpse of the hindquarters of his glory. Here we're dealing with great mysteries. We're talking here theologically about the hidden will of God. God has chosen to reveal only so much. What I mean by that, as Deuteronomy 29, 29 says, the secret things of the Lord. And so when God talked about his face, his back, his hands, he was speaking figuratively. He was expressing the invisible majesty of his eternal being in terms of human body parts, physical things that symbolize spiritual realities. God's face refers in some ways to the direct revelation of the essence of his divine majesty. So to see God's back is to have some lesser experience of his glory. So we might think of what Moses saw as contrails of God's glory, luminous clouds that trailed from his divine being. God said that as his glory passed by, he would cover Moses with his hand. There was a place in the rock where Moses could hide. There he would be under the shadow of the care of God. God would shield him from the radiance of his glory. To put it in a more provocative way, Moses was protected by God from God. It is important to see this because people often think of himself being under the shadow of God's hand as an image of comfort for the trials of life. And the Bible uses the image this way in Isaiah 51, 16. And yet here in Exodus 33, the protection God affords is protection from the greatness of his own glory. So in the word of God, we see God working out a way of salvation that allows for us to know him without being destroyed. We need this protection, not because of any deficiency in God, but because of his absolute perfection. The glory of God is more than any mere mortal can bear. So now one wonders whether Moses was tempted to peek. Here was an opportunity no one else had ever had been given, a chance to gaze upon the mystery of all mysteries to see the glory of God. One glance would have been fatal, but it still must have been tempting because this is what human beings have always wanted, a direct experience of Almighty God. And this is why people still go on spiritual journeys and experiences, why they keep asking ultimate religious questions. Is it because we want to know God, we want to understand God, we want to perceive God. In a word, we want to see Him. And this is often the way that people describe it. They want to see God. This was a longing that Job expressed when he said in Job 19, 26, and 27, In my flesh I will see God, I myself will see him with my own eyes, I and not another, how my heart yearns within me. King David wanted to see the same thing, and he says this in Psalm 17, 15, And I in righteousness I will see your face when I awake, I will be satisfied with seeing your likeness. This is what human beings have always longed for. We want to see God so that we will know him as he is. This is why it's so wonderful that God sent Jesus to be our Savior. Jesus came so we could see God. There's a story about this in the Gospels. One of the disciples said to Jesus, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us in John 14, 8. In other words, let us see God. But Jesus said in John 14, 9, Don't you know, Philip, even after I have been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. See, the Father and the Son are one. Jesus is God every bit as the Father is. So to know him is to know God. To love him is to love God. And to see him is to see God. And as the disciples reflected on the relationship with Jesus, they were amazed to discover that in him they had been with God all along. The Apostle John wrote in words that echoed Moses and the Exodus, The Word became flesh and made His dwelling literally tabernacled among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. No one has ever seen God, but God, the, the one and the only who is at the Father's side, has made Him known. In John 1.14 and John 1.18, and we also see it in 2 Corinthians 4.6. So John was talking about Jesus, and he was saying that the glory of God had been revealed to 
to him. No, and not even Moses has seen the face of God, the essence of his eternal being. But Jesus Christ as God manifests in the flesh. So to know Jesus is to know the God of all glory. And so the more that we see of Jesus, the more that we see of God. This is true figuratively. So to see God is to perceive his divine attributes and understand the way of his salvation. And the way we come to know these things is by studying what the Bible teaches about the person and work of Jesus Christ. But one day we will literally be able to see Jesus. Jesus has risen from the dead in a glorious body. And when we too have been risen, we will be able to see him with our very own eyes. 1 Corinthians 13, 12 says this, Now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see him face to face. Only when we ourselves have been raised to glory, we will be able to bear the sight of Christ in his glory without being destroyed. In the heart of every believer, there is a yearning yet unsatisfied to see this promise fulfilled. So, even though it is far beyond our comprehension, we know there is still more for us to see, and we long to gaze upon the beautiful face of Jesus Christ. And so, in the meantime, we should ask God to show us as much of His glory as presently that we can bear. Well, I want to thank you for listening or watching this episode of Reading the Bible Daily with Dave. My name is Dave, and today is May 18th, and we've looked at Exodus 33. Until tomorrow, may God bless you and keep you. Thank you for listening to today's episode of Reading the Bible Daily with Dave podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to the show and rate us wherever you listen to podcasts. Be sure to also like, subscribe, or follow Servants of Grace on Facebook, Instagram, X, or YouTube. We appreciate your support.